WWC 2019 has just finished and okay this was much better than I expected I was I was having some pretty high hopes for this but it was actually much better than that so everything that I talked about in our what to expect video came true except for one thing um, and that's the arm MacBook so we didn't really see that but that was just a thing that I was maybe expecting to see teased but yeah all the announcements were huge and we even got a really big hardware announcement so here's everything that we'll talk about today So starting off with iOS 13, apparently we had a 97% customer satisfaction for iOS 12 in 2018 uh, and 85% of the customers are on the latest release compared to about 10% on Android. And even though I wasn't expecting this, iOS 13 does come with some pretty big software uh, performance improvements as well. So we get 30% faster face ID unlock, uh, app downloads are 50% smaller and updates are 60% smaller as well. We got two times faster app launch speed, which is Pretty interesting, I'm guessing that Apple actually reduced the animation speed in order to achieve this. And yes, we do have a really awesome wallpaper. I think this is one of my favorite ones ever in any iOS release so far. And yes, dark mode is officially here. Uh, so we do get a redesigned lock screen as well. It's slightly redesigned uh, with black accents uh, when using dark mode. And all the first party apps actually use a perfect black background. News, calendar, notes, messages, all of those have been updated and they look really, really good. Uh, also speaking of messages, there's a new keyboard kind of, so you can now swipe uh, in order to type. So this is pretty much a Swift key ripoff, but yeah, there it goes, it's here in iOS 13. We have a brand new share panel. So you get suggestions now for contacts and even third party apps. Uh, so that's quite useful. And speaking of useful, the music app got some got a pretty big update, and that's timed synced lyrics. So finally, there you go. We now have essentially karaoke in the music app. You can now have custom uh, text sizes in Safari, and these are actually saved for each individual website. We got some new font options in Mail, along with new features for, for organization. The Reminders got a pretty big update. So the main one is that Reminders are now contextual aware. Uh, so for example, you can type something, I don't know, Reminder at 5 p.m. tomorrow, and it would automatically schedule a reminder for that time. And Maps got a really big update in terms of how they look like, so they've actually been rebuilt from the ground up, uh, and this entire new look would be available in the US for the time being by the end of 2019. And what's really cool about Maps is that you can now add favorite places uh, to Maps collections, by the way, so you can organize your favorites, uh, and you can have share lists with friends, and there's also this brand new feature called uh, look around. So this enables basically street view, like in like in Google Street View, same thing basically. And if you turn your phone in landscape, you can smoothly drive, so to say, uh, through the streets. And I, I do like this the way this works. I think it works really, really nice. Uh, and so far, it looks to be better than Street View. We got some new privacy features. So for example, you can now enable uh, the location just one time. So when an app asks you, you can just enable once and then you can have the same setting again. You now get alerts when background tracking is on for certain apps. Uh, there's also Wi-Fi and Bluetooth protections implemented now so that apps can track your location using those. And probably my favorite one is the new sign-in with Apple. So this basically replaces the old sign-in with Google or Facebook, etc. Uh, without any tracking, so it actually generates a one-time login with Face ID, which means that none of your Google passwords or username or anything that you have will be actually shared. So this will actually create a brand new email that's generated every time uh, you use this app. And yes, this actually works on macOS as well. And HomeKit is actually getting some pretty big updates. So at the moment, if you use a third party uh, camera, video camera to stream video, it would actually go through their own clouds. So if you lose, if you use a Logitech camera, it would go to Logitech's cloud and so on. Uh, so Apple just introduced HomeKit secure video, which means that the video is actually analyzed on your device locally and then securely sends to the iCloud afterwards. And you get a uh, 10 day free storage with iCloud and you can actually have up to five cameras on a two terabyte storage plan. And yes, Logitech cameras would be supported. So if you want to see a video on that, let me know in the comments. There's also going to be a few routers that are HomeKit enabled. So for example, if one device is compromised, it won't affect your other devices. There are three brands that are supported at the moment. Um, and we might see more most likely in the future. And Messages got a pretty big update as well. Uh, so that cloud stored photo and name is now live. So yes, that's the thing in iOS 13 as, as expected. And the Memojis, yes, we got we got some new options in terms of customization. So eyeshadow, glasses, hats, and even, yes, even AirPods, you can have AirPods uh, added to your Memoji. So yeah, lots and lots of customizable options. There are some brand new Memoji stickers that are actually automatically created and incorporated into the Emoji keyboard based on your own Memoji. Uh, 
We have some new options in the camera app. So now we have this brand new studio mode, uh, the scene called high key mono, and you can even adjust the intensity of the studio lighting now. And the Photos app itself also got some pretty big updates. So uh, now all the settings are visible from the main editing menu. We have more effects such as even noise reduction. Uh, and you can even apply those, yes, on videos. You can do noise reduction on videos. You can rotate a video now. So that's really awesome. And Photos will now automatically remove duplicates and clutter such as invoices, screenshots, stuff like that. And you can organize photos in different categories now, years, months, and days. And all of these would be AI uh, organized. I really do love the small design improvements in iOS 13. So we have rounded corners. Uh, we have improved transparency. So yeah, overall, it's a more refined design this year. And the AirPods also got some updates as well. So now Siri on the, on the AirPods can now read incoming messages. And then audio sharing is now possible by bringing two devices closer. And then you can even do handoff to the HomePod. So you just take your iPhone, you bring it close to your HomePod, and you can send whatever song is playing from your iPhone to the HomePod. There's a new live radio option in the music app with 100,000 uh, radio stations. And the HomePod is a bit smarter now, so it can actually recognize who is speaking to it and give you a more personalized response. CarPlay dashboard got a few new updates in terms of the looks. And this is, I would say, a pretty big one. So the Shortcuts app is now built into iOS 13, so you don't have to download it separately anymore. And this is so useful because you can now create, you could do this in iOS 12 as well, but now it's natively and built in. You can create custom shortcuts for Siri uh, and even have more templates now. Siri also got a brand new voice. So she sounds more natural. The words are actually linked together almost flawlessly now. This is based on your own networks, by the way. So everything, her voice is now 100% generated by software, uh, but a voice still sounds a bit, a bit too robotic for me. Okay, so this was every everything in terms of iOS. So what about, I haven't really talked about the iPad, what about the iPad? Well, apparently iOS for the iPad will now be called iPadOS and it will be a completely different-ish thing. So we get all the features from iOS 13, but we get so, so many more. So for example, you can now pin widgets to the home screen. Yes, exactly like I wanted. Home screen widgets, finally. And we also have some more space on a home screen. So everything gets a bit more, has a bit more room to breathe. Slide over has been improved. So instead of having just one app as a slide over, you can have pretty much as many as you want and then simply swipe through them and even open a multitasking and see all of them open at the same time. So that's a huge improvement. Then split view also got some pretty big updates. So we now have multi-window support. So for example, we can now have two notes apps side by side open at the same time, just like in macOS. So yes, App Expose is available on the iPad just like uh, just like in macOS. So now you can have two Microsoft Word documents open at the same time side by side, mail, and so much more. And then yes, as requested by so many users, the Files app got some pretty big updates as well. So we have a new, a few new views. We have icon list column views for files. And we have quick actions now for rotating. We have rich metadata finally. Uh, we have iCloud Drive support for uh, folder sharing. We have even servers that are supported. So SMB file sharing, that's huge. So we can finally connect. I can connect the iPad to our server here in the office, finally. Uh, USB and SD cards are supported natively. By the way, especially USB drives, that's that's gonna be working. And you can even direct import from a, from a camera into a specific app, such as Lightroom, without having you to transfer the files uh, to the files app first and only then transfer them to Lightroom. So you can do that, you can do that now uh, in, in just one go. Local storage is supported finally on the iPad. There's also desktop browsing in Safari. So automatically, uh, you would automatically load the desktop page rather than the mobile. So this works really well on things such as Squarespace, for example, not a sponsor, <laughs> but just saying. Uh, you also get a download manager in Safari. You get 30 new keyboard shortcuts. And yes, you even get custom fonts. This is on iOS 13, not just on the iPad. Uh, so you can download custom fonts from the App Store and you can use them in Photoshop, you can use them in Lightroom. And we even have some scrolling improvements. So now you can grab the scroll wheel uh, and you can quickly scroll through a page. And we have some brand new gestures as well on the iPad. So now you can grab the cursor, you can move it anywhere you want. Uh, you can drag a selection and you even have three pinch to copy with three fingers. Uh, you can do this twice to cut and then three fingers spread to paste. We have three fingers swipe to undo and I'm guessing the opposite way would be redo. And then the Apple Pencil actually got an update as well. And this is a huge, huge one. So we're going from a 20 second latency, millisecond latency, which was actually the best one uh, in the industry to just nine milliseconds in a software update, which is, which is huge. Also the uh, Pencil Kit API is now open to developers. So you can now have the same uh, tray that we have in the notes app. You can have it in different third party apps. And something that was on the 10.5 inch iPad Pro, but Apple removed it from the 11 inch was or is pinch to shrink the keyboard, which is now back in iOS 13. So there you go, you can now do it. You can even swipe on the keyboard to type on. So that's a pretty big update as well. Now moving on to macOS, this is actually the one that I'm interested in the most, Macs and especially macOS, because I use a Mac, you know, for most of the day, don't use an iPhone for like, 
not even four hours a day. And Apple claims that Mac is number one in terms of customer satisfaction, which I strongly, strongly disagree. I don't think that's true, especially when it comes to all the keyboard issues that Apple has had. They got so much backlash because of that. So I'm very skeptical regarding this. And macOS 10.15 is officially called macOS Catalina. Catalina. <laughs> yeah. It's a bit of an odd name. And the main feature is in terms of iTunes. So it's getting a calendar officially. It's getting a, it's getting a mail built in. <laughs> joking and Craig was obviously joking as well. But yeah, Apple Music, uh, Apple Podcasts and Apple TV would be three separate apps. So now if you plug in your iPhone, you're probably wondering what's gonna happen because iTunes is now gone, yes. Well, you won't get a pop-up anymore, but you actually see an icon in the test bar uh, on the Mac and this will be available in Finder as well. Now, in terms of the podcast tab, this one is very similar to the one on the iPad. So we have Listen Now, we have pretty much the same features as on the iPhone and the iPad, just optimized for the larger Max display. In the Apple TV app, you'll now have 4K HDR playback on recent Macs, also Dolby Atmos in terms of the sound on the latest Macs. And this is one of my favorite features in macOS and iOS 13. So uh, it's called Sidecar, a really weird name, but essentially you can now use the iPad as a secondary display for your Mac, both wired and wirelessly. And it works on all the apps, by the way, with a pencil that support tablets. So you can use uh, the pencil, Apple Pencil in Final Cut Pro on the iPad's display. You can use Photoshop on the iPad with the Apple Pencil. There'll be After Effects, a ton of them. RIP all third-party apps that were capable of doing this. And voice control is coming to iOS and also macOS. Now, I'm not talking about the pre-Siri voice control. If you guys remember that, hopefully any of you do, leave a like if you do. Uh, but yeah, this is something new that allows you to control your Mac or your iOS device using your voice. So it's a bit different than what we had before because this one actually splits the UI into grids and you can actually select which one uh, you want the operating system to tap on. We got a brand new Find My app, uh, which is basically Find My iPhone plus Find My Friends combined and this works on iOS as well. And what's even better is that now you can actually locate Apple devices when they are offline. This works perfectly on the Mac because when they get lost or stolen and they're not connected to, uh, you know, cellular, they would actually send a Bluetooth beacon that can be detected by other Apple devices, iPhones and iPads and so on. Uh, and this is end-to-end -end encryption, by the way. So those devices will actually pinpoint the location of your stolen Mac device. Hopefully that doesn't really happen. Speaking of stolen uh, Macs, activation lock is finally coming to the Mac. This will work on all Macs with a T2 processor, the famous T2 processor. Also, screen time from the iPhone and the iPad is coming to the Mac. And Apple also talked about the big Marzipan Phase 2, which is coming this year. Uh, so this is now called Project Catalyst and you can actually create apps for Macs based on iPad apps. Uh, and it does have a lot of improvements over phase one, which we got last year. So we get improved sidebar, we get smoother scrolling. And this will work natively in Xcode, so you can just tap a switch. Uh, and there you go, boom, your app will actually work on macOS natively. Um, Apple also showcased Asphalt 9 working on the Mac, extremely fluid, and Twitter. Yes, we're now getting back the native Twitter app. And then Apple has also showed us something quite new. This is called Reality Kit, and it's basically Air Kit, but with physics and also automatic edge detection and all that. And you'll have Reality Composer in which you can create scenes for Reality Kit. And this will be built into Xcode. And yes, it also works on iOS devices for testing. And we also got AR Kit 3.0, which features Yes, finally, people occlusion. This is huge. So now you can actually uh, get avoided by obstacles and planes and all that that fly around your scene. This is really cool. And it also supports motion capture. So you can actually move in the scene and you can have a character that tracks your movement in AR. We also got a preview of Minecraft in AR. <laughs> yes, Minecraft Earth, this is how it's called. And uh, it looked really, really, really impressive. And it seemed to work extremely well. Now, if you're a developer, you're gonna love this section. So Swift UI is gonna replace UI kits and also app kits. So you can actually have multiple pages of code. These could be replaced by just a few lines. So the libraries that Apple is including in Swift UI are just huge and you can do so much more things with those. Probably the biggest one is this one. So in Swift UI, you can actually have real time code preview, just like in Playgrounds for the iPad, but this is now in Xcode, real time preview. You can just drag and drop the code, you can drop uh, modules, and then you can test all that on uh, in the preview window and also on your device in real time. And probably the best part about it is that any changes that you make in the code uh, would be automatically applied to the iOS device that's connected. So no need to rebuild anything automatically, uh, everything would be done. We also get automatic and also built-in support for things such as multiple languages and even dark mode. So no need to code or program dark mode uh, independently, everything's there built in. And speaking of built-in things, there's also a native framework for building watch apps too, which can also be tested uh, in real time. And speaking of watches, WatchOS 6 
is here as well. And we get a few new watch faces. Yes, not just one, but we get quite a few of them. Uh, so this is the biggest update in terms of watch faces. We get a gradient watch face, we get a large normal watch face, we get a digital face, we get California dial, we get a solar face. So there go five brand new watch faces. And here's something really cool. There's a new taptic chime. Uh, so this is something new or a silent tab basically on your wrist when it's on the hour. Uh, that's really useful. And we also get some new Apple Watch apps. The so brand new ones like audiobooks, we get a voice memos uh, app, also a calculator app, and you have a tip calculator. Uh, you can split the bill with friends on there and the biggest thing in my opinion is the app store so now you have an app store on the apple watch where you can download native watchOS apps so previously you had to download an iphone app and if that iphone app had an extension for the apple watch only then you know you would actually have the app on your Apple Watch. But now we have full support for native apps made just for the Apple Watch. And yes, you can download all of those directly from the App Store, the new App Store on the Apple Watch itself. And there's a few new streaming audio APIs that are supported. Uh, there's a few improvements when it comes to the health and fitness capabilities, so activity trends. Uh, for example, if your trend is down this week, you'll get suggestions on how to improve it and notifications and all that. There's some hearing health improvements where uh, the Apple Watch would notify you if the ambient sound is too loud. There's cycle tracking for menstrual cycle tracking for women. There's a few new complications for audiobooks and all the new apps that I mentioned before. So that was everything in terms of the Apple Watch. Now in terms of tvOS, this was, normally I wasn't expecting to mention this in this video, but they released some pretty big updates. So they showed us For All Mankind, which is an Apple original movie or TV show, I'm not sure which one it is, uh, but this was made by the creator of Battlestar Galactica and Star Trek and it looked really, really impressive. I would definitely watch that. Speaking of watching things, there's a redesigned home screen uh, with full screen previews, which kind of looks like a Netflix clone, clone, to be honest. But yeah, I do like this. I do like this a lot. We also get multi-user support for tvOS. Finally, this was so, so needed for, you know, actual TVs and the Apple TV. Unfortunately, we still don't have it on the iPad or the iPhone, but maybe you know, maybe one day. And just like on Netflix, everything would be personalized for that user. So movies, TV shows, music, and all that. There's a brand new control center on the Apple TV, which looks really good, pretty much identical to the one on iOS and, and the iPad. Uh, also, there's karaoke mode for music. So same as on iOS, you can see the lyrics of the songs and, you know, sing along or whatever. And probably the biggest feature, in my opinion, is support, native support for the Xbox and the PS4 controllers. So no need to buy anything, anything third party, you can just use those. And yeah, you can play your tvOS games with those controllers. How cool is that? We also got some brand new screensavers, a new aquatic or underwater screensaver. So yeah, overall, this is the biggest change ever. Well, the second biggest change when it comes to tvOS. The first one being, you know, when tvOS was launched. But I, don't, I wouldn't really call that a change. And speaking of changes, this is really cool. So the biggest announcement from the event was not software related, but hardware related. Yes, we did, we did get a preview of the new Mac Pro, but it's way better than a preview because Apple has not only showed us a teaser of the Mac Pro, but the actual Mac Pro with all the specs and everything that you need to know. So there you go. This is this is how it looks like. And it, I don't know, it looks like a bad concept. Honestly, I don't, I really don't like this design. I think the previous one looked so, so much better. So I'm not sure how I feel about this, but there we go, it's stainless steel frame. Uh, it's easy to access. So all the components, both the panels can be taken off. So uh, it's fully modular. You get 360 degree access to all the components. Okay, so what about the specs? Well, CPU wise, this is an Intel Xeon 28 core processor, uh, just like I predicted in the previous Mac Pro video. It has over 300 watts of power, so no throttling there at all. Apparently, according to Apple, there's no throttling, so we'll see about that. Uh, it comes with 2933 megahertz ECC memory. We get six channels, so 12 DIMM slots, by the way, up to 1.5 terabytes, yes, of ECC RAM. And this thing is such a beast. So PCIe expansion is back. So we have eight internal PCI slots. Uh, we have four double wide, we have three single wide. We have two Thunderbolt 3 ports uh, on the IO card and then two more ports on the top. We have two 10 gigabit Ethernet ports. And then of course that if you want to expand this even more, you can actually add more uh, modules with Thunderbolt 3. So so yeah, I think you can have like eight in total. So you can have uh, 16 Thunderbolt 3 ports, I think. Don't quote me on this. I'll, we'll do a separate video just on the Mac Pro. So more detailed one is coming. Okay, so what about the GPU? Well, Apple released a brand new GPU, kinda. It's a module, an expansion module, and it's called the MPX module, the Mac Pro expansion module. And it supports multiple graphics options. So this thing has the GPU built in basically. But you can have a Radeon Pro 560, 580X. You can have a Radeon Pro Vega 2. This is brand new. Uh, up to 14 teraflops and up to 32 gigabytes of HBM2 memory. And what's really cool about this MPX module is that you can have up to two Vega 2. So you can have 28 teraflops of GPU compute power. So this is actually the 
world's most powerful graphics card. Now, since this was made in partnership with AMD, it also supports AMD's Infinity Fabric, so you can have up to two MPX modules connected to one another. So in that case, you can have four Radeon Vega 2s, so up to 56 teraflops of GPU compute power and up to 12, uh, 128 actually, uh, gigabytes of HPM to memory. So this thing is just, wow. But wait, there's more. Apple released a new card, uh, a hardware accelerated video editing card called the Afterburner, which is actually very similar to something that Red has with Red Rocket. But essentially with this thing, you can do ProRes and ProRes RAW in three streams, uh, streams of 8K ProRes RAW. So you can basically edit three clips of 8K footage at the same time. And the Mac Pro can now suck up to 1.4 kilowatts, uh, which is the power supply. So yeah, that's... Um, that's definitely the most Apple has ever put in any Mac. And in terms of the cooling system, we now have three fans uh, up to 300 cubic feet per minute. So apparently in terms of the noise, this is as quiet as an iMac Pro. So that's really impressive. And you can even attach wheels, yes, optional wheels uh, to the Mac Pro because this thing is not going to be light at all. Now, in terms of actual performance, uh, my maxed out 2019 MacBook Pro with a Vega 20 and i9 processor eight core can do about 70 to 80 tracks in Logic. Uh, this new Mac Pro, maxed out, can do literally over a thousand audio tracks. So performance-wise, this thing is just ridiculous. And yeah, Apple even showed us some Final Cut Pro 10 performance. Uh, so they played back 8K ProRes RAW in real time in quality, not even performance mode quality. So that's full res. They added 3D effects and color correction and everything was playing back in real time. Keep in mind that this is 8K RAW and they um, actually duplicated that. So we had three streams uh, of 4K RAW at the same time, all with color grading, all with titles in full quality. That's, um, yeah, this is uh, the most powerful computer on the planet in terms of video editing. And that's uh, by a long, long margin. And then to go alongside this brand new Mac Pro, there's also that brand new Apple 6K monitor that we actually did a few renders of a few a while ago. So there you go, this is how it looks like. It looks really, really nice from the front. Now from the back, it looks uh, pretty bad. It has that cheese grater design, just like the Mac Pro, apparently that's actually there for cooling. So this monitor, yes, it supports HDR. So HDR up to 1000 nits of continuous and sustained brightness. It's 32 inches in size, 6K in resolution, 218 PPI, so it's a retina display, and over 40% larger than the iMac 5K's 27 inch display. It's a P3 display, obviously it supports 10 bits natively. It has reference mode, it has a super wide viewing angle. It even has a anti-reflective coating and you can opt in for a matte coating. Um, also, every single LED has been individually calibrated and yes, the rare panel, like I said before, acts as a heatsink. And what's really impressive about this is, is that it can actually go up to 1600 nits of peak brightness. Interesting enough, it has a contrast ratio of 1 million to 1, which is the same as on the iPhone XS Max. And that's an OLED display. This is not an OLED from what I've seen. It's not even micro LED or mini LED. Uh, more about that once Apple, you know, details all the specs in terms of this display. But this is also, they're calling this the Pro Display HDR, uh, XDR. So this is a really weird name for this display, but it's coming from Extreme Dynamic Range. Uh, and it's a Thunderbolt 3 display, which means that this works even on the 15-inch MacBook Pro. So you can have two displays, two 6K displays on the 15-inch MacBook Pro. And on the Mac Pro, you can have up to six... 6K displays. It also comes with a pro stand, kind of, you have to buy it separately, but it has a contrabalancing arm, uh, and essentially the display will feel weightless, apparently, with that arm. Uh, you can rotate it in portrait mode, the sender is removable, so you can even attach a VESA mount, so yeah, which attaches in a few seconds, according to Apple, and also according to Apple, this is the best pro display that money can buy. And in terms of the prices, apparently the uh, baseline Mac Pro uh, will come with an 8-core processor, 32 gigabytes of ECC memory, the Radeon Pro 580X, 256 gigabytes of SSD storage, and it's gonna start at $6,000. That's actually less than I expected. I was expecting this to start at about 15K, that was the leak price. But again, these specs are not that great. This is weaker than a baseline Mac Pro, iMac Pro, sorry, so yeah. Now, in terms of in terms of the display, uh, that's gonna cost, I was expecting about $1,000, maybe 2,000 max. It starts at 5,000. Not even joking, $5,000 for that monitor. Apparently it's really, really good. I, I really wanna see it in person. I won't get one obviously, but yeah, I really wanna try it. And then <laughs> what's really funny is that the stand, that pro stand that I mentioned before, that one is $1,000. So you have to buy it separately, I believe. I'm not fully, fully sure about this, but 
that seems to be the case. You have to buy it separately and it's a thousand dollars. Yeah, so the Mac Pro is coming in fall, which, you know, by Apple's terms, that probably means December or so. Uh, but in terms of iOS and the iPad OS and Mac OS and watchOS and TVOS, those are actually available today. So you can get a beta for the developer uh, starting today. And then the public beta is coming in July. So next month, if you don't want to, you know, pay to be a rest of the developer or whatever, you can just wait and you can get a public beta. But again, those betas are really buggy. So I wouldn't recommend installing those on your main device. There we go. Uh, sorry if this video appeared to be a bit rushed, but I, I had to talk as quickly as I could because there was a lot of stuff that I had to cover in this video. Uh, there's quite a few new videos coming out this week in terms of iOS 13, iPadOS, and everything you need to know in terms of those. So do subscribe if you're new to the channel and you wanna see more videos like this one. They will be really, really detailed as always, or even more detailed as always, uh, videos on the Mac Pro and everything you need to know in terms of that. So yeah, thank you for watching. I'm Daniel and I'll see you guys in, um, yeah, in the next videos. Buckle up because this is going to be one crazy week. So enough tech, signing notes. Cheers.